we first approached Leach to be apprentices with him because we'd read his book. And uh, we had gotten out of art school where we had studied ceramics and found that we were not ready to start a pottery. So we wrote uh, Leach and asked him, could we come and talk about being a apprentice? He said, yes, of course. We took examples of our work with us, and of course, when he saw them, he said immediately, I'm sorry, we're full up. Um, they were very bad pots. <clears throat> but uh, we said, well, uh, do you mind if we stay around? We had a, a two-week uh, reservation in a bed and breakfast, because that was the shortest reservation we could get. And, uh, can we stay around for two weeks and learn as much as we uh, can while we're here? He said, that's fine. And so we did. We went up to the pottery every day. It was a three-quarter mile up a hill, which had about a 45-degree angle. And uh, But we, we went there every day. We uh, had the, the bed and breakfast make us a, a lunch. And uh, we talked to the guys. We watched them. We learned a lot. And at the end of the two weeks, or toward the end of the two weeks, Bernard said, well, <clears throat> we're getting ready to fire our big kill. And uh, I happen to still be sitting a kill shift on the kill firing. Do you want to come and talk while I'm here? And we said, of course we did, because that was our last opportunity. And so uh, he said, <laughs> Uh, my kill shift is from 1 o'clock in the morning until 4 a.m. So it's okay. Uh, and uh, we went back to the house and uh, had a nap and then uh, I got up at midnight and walked up the hill. And uh, we sat and talked with Leach for, uh, from 1 o'clock <clears throat> until 8 o'clock the next morning. Uh, and we didn't talk about pottery. We talked about uh, philosophy and uh, politics and uh, world history and uh, all sorts of things, but we didn't touch on pottery at all. And uh, at the end of the time, we were heading for the train and back to London and on with our trip. But at the end of the time, he said, well, I've changed my mind and you can come back as apprentices. And so uh, we said, well, we, <clears throat> we had to go home because we had a commitment to do some teaching, uh, which we had already made. Uh, but he said, all right, there's no room for a, a, a year anyway. And we went home and uh, worked for a year, saved some money, and came back uh, with Bernard on a, on a boat. He had been in America and this would be in 1950 on a lecture tour. And we arranged to go back to England on the same boat with him. So we had another seven days crossing the Atlantic. It was a very slow boat in those days. <laughs> uh, but we had seven days crossing the Atlantic talking with him, and it was marvelous. And as we arrived in Southampton, he said, well, now do you have a place to live? We said, no, we'll find a, a place somewhere. And uh, he said, well, do you want to live with me? Because it turned out he had just separated from his wife, and uh, he couldn't stand to live alone. So uh, he lived with him for two and a half years. And that was the best part of our training, believe me. <clears throat> in the pottery, working in the daytime, we learned about how to put clay where we wanted it to be, not just where it was going to be by chance. Uh, but at night, we learned about why we were doing this. And we also were privileged to meet all sorts of people who came to visit Bernard, and uh, people from all over the world. And uh, we had dinner with some of the really important artists from the area who were his friends and came to visit. And it was a marvelous experience. And uh, Bernard also, I would say, encouraged us to work in the evenings and on the weekends in the studio 
and make our own work because he knew that just doing what we called standard wear in the day wasn't really training us. And so uh, he encouraged that. And, uh, we, and we did. We, we made a lot of pots in the evenings and, and uh, weekends. That was in the, in the early 1960s. And I don't know, it was a time when the whole university was in ferment. Uh, and uh, it was the most exciting time to be teaching uh, that I ever had because the, the students were there in the studio constantly and they gingered up one another, you know? I mean, they, they, each one was challenging the others to do better and do better and do better. Uh, they taught themselves, I think, more than I taught them, I would say, at that time because they were just wonderful students. Well, that, you have to go back to the time, I guess, when my first wife and I were in school together. Uh, at the Art Institute of Chicago. At the Art Institute of Chicago. We had both started out as uh, painting majors. She got into ceramics because she was teaching a, in a settlement school on the west side of Chicago, and she felt that these young Mexican kids would respond more to clay than they would to a crayon and so on and so she took some ceramic courses. I got into ceramics because I got drafted out of art school into the army in uh, 40, 42, 42. And when I got discharged in 46, after the war was over, I came back thinking, now I'm gonna take up my painting again. Well, all the painting classes were filled because uh, all the uh, returning GIs who could had gone to school, and many of them went to art school. They went to painting classes, filled the painting classes. So I said, well, what's open? And, uh, and they said, uh, well, there's room in the ceramics class. And so I said, okay, at least it gets me back into school. What I didn't know was it was not a very good ceramics class. Um, it, the the teacher was not a potter, was a person who had been trained, but more in the science of ceramics than in the art of ceramics. And uh, so we never, in two and a half years that I was in that ceramic class, we never talked about what makes a good pot. Why is this a better pot than that pot? Why is this a bad pot? Why do you like this one? Or what? We never talked about it. But somewhere along the line, someone discovered Bernard Leach's book, and that was what got us started up on, on uh, the track. And Leach was an advocate of making pots the way he had seen them made in Japan, economically, sell them inexpensively, get them out to the public. And we had been influenced a great deal by the pottery that we saw in the Smith uh, in the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. And uh, we found, uh, both of us, that the pots that we liked the best, not necessarily the best pots, but the pots that we responded to were all pots that people had used in their everyday life. And so we said, well, if, you know, in ancient China, in Persia, in Africa, in every country that we looked at, at any period of time, the pots we liked were all things people had used. Why should we think it's any different in America in 1940-odd, you know? And so we said, that's what we should do. And so we started out with that, and Leach, of course, reinforced it, and uh, uh, we've carried on ever since, and I, I've carried on ever since. So all my pots were really made to be made of economically as possible, uh, made to be used in a home, uh, that controls the scale of them to a certain extent, uh, but they're also made so that I can sell them as inexpensively as possible. And that doesn't endear me to the ceramic community as a whole. <laughs>